Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, great to have you with us. Now, uh, Tracy, you, um, you, uh, Mark. We heard from Mark last week that it was actually through your uh, child developing cancer and then subsequently dying that actually brought you and Mark to Christ. Um, can you just walk us through the journey of that grief? Okay, I'll try and give you a condensed version okay. of that journey. Um, so, yeah, as Mark said, um, when our son was three, he was diagnosed with cancer and eventually took his life. And Mark and I were 23, so we were um, really young. pretty young to uh, go through that. Um, we And we did become Christians through that journey, which I'm, I think Mark might have spoken to people about. There was a pharmacist at the hospital who uh, introduced us to Jesus, so that's how that happened. Um, it's been a it's, a, it's a journey that, to be honest, I'm still on. Um, so I'm still, it, it's still a grief, I still grieve. Um, but I think um, three things, Ray, I thought when you asked me that question uh, that, that stood out for me. One was trying to come to terms with the disbelief, um, the disbelief that... Um, uh, it just wasn't supposed to happen that way. So your child is not supposed to die. You should not bury your child. Mm. Um, it should actually be the other way around. Uh, so coming to terms with that, coming to terms with um, being totally powerless and totally out of control of I had no control over the disease. I had no control over the treatment. I had no control over his life and ultimately I had no control over life that uh, was a big uh, lesson for me. And the third thing was the brokenness. So I was broken. You hear the uh, expression of broken heart. My heart was literally in pieces and ached, like it ached. It felt like it was really broken. Um, but what the, the interesting thing is what actually God did with that and what God did with that brokenness. The first thing I want to say is that God did not fix that brokenness. Um, and that kind of sounds a bit strange, but God really used that brokenness and he still uses that brokenness now. Even third, nearly 30 years later, he still uses that um, for his glory. Um, so then what happened next was God, um, with that brokenness, what he did, two things I think he did, if I can summarise it. Um, he, he turned the powerlessness, the... Um, the brokenness and the disbelief into trust in Jesus. So I absolutely put every ounce, every little drop of trust I had in Jesus, knowing that what he had done, I had to just trust in what had happened. Um, and the second thing was he gave me was assurance. So more than hope, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the word hope and I thought hope is when you're wanting something to happen but assurance, which is what God gave me, is really knowing. So I knew, I knew where Ben was, that was his name. I knew he was with Jesus and I had the assurance that one day I too will be with Jesus. So, um, And after that, what God did after that was also two things. I think I'm trying to condense um, 30 years of stuff. Um, was, um, and this sounds strange, I hesitated in saying this out loud to people because you may think I'm a bit weird, but God all, turned all of that. What happened after that was I actually um, thanked God for that experience. Mm. And I didn't thank God that my child had suffered and went through, you know, it was tragic and, and you wouldn't wish it on anybody. But um, I thanked God for that when, um, just when you... When you have to put your trust in God, you know that God, I, I know that God only does things for good, for the good of um, the world, for the good of people, for the good of me. So I knew that somehow, um, I, I don't know, I just trusted that this was a good, good will come out of this. Um, so, and the other thing he did was he changed um, the course of my life, like the trajectory of my life switched. I was, I, I'd been to, um, I'd studied uh, to be a computer programmer and I did that for a while but I then stopped that after this happened. I went to uni, I became a social worker. I started working um, with children from trauma in child protection and I'm still there 30 years later. Wow. And, um, and that ultimately led to Mark and I becoming foster carers. Yeah. 
So, yes, you not only, so clearly, just in that example, we can see how God has used one of the biggest sorrows you can have in life to lose a child, so young especially, uh, and then to use it by transforming you and Mark, trusting in him, loving others. Know that you, you're not just a professional carer. I mean, you're involved in that professionally, but you've allowed that world to open up in your own home. You've, um, Mark hinted at how many children you've uh, adopted and fostered. We, I wasn't sure exactly the figure. What exactly was it? I think it's around about 16. 16. Yeah. 16 children you've either adopted or fostered yeah. over the years. Yeah. Can you just tell us what motivates you to bring children uh, into your home when you've already got your own children? One's right there now, Kayla. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she motivates me. I needed... No, no, that's <laughs> Um, no, really, really, Jesus motivates me. That's the real motivation. But I think two things Jesus has given me. One is a passion for children and an, and an endless, I can, this is very hard to explain, but an endless, an endless energy. It reminds me of the Duracell ad, yeah. right? The, the battery that I'm ever sure. Ever ready. Ever ready, whichever it is, yeah. Those yeah. long-lasting batteries, God has put one in my head and in my heart. I think oh. that's, and it just never runs out. Oh. I don't need a lot of sleep. Like oh. I, I can go on four or five hours, probably five hours sleep is, oh. is enough. And endless patience. Um, so, because you need a lot of patience. <laughs> Some days are harder than others. But, um, yeah, patience. Tracy, yeah. can you tell me if... Uh, if children are, there, there are lots of, you mean, I think you may know the details, how, how many kids are needing to be uh, fostered in, uh, in, in either Sydney or New South yeah. Wales? Well, I can give you a, a broad and then a breakdown okay. picture. So in Australia, there's about 43,000 children at the moment in out-of-home care. Wow. Half of those children are with relatives or in kinship care. Um, the other, uh, half of them are around under the age of nine. In New South Wales, there's about 19,000 children in out-of-home care. And in Western Sydney, so in this patch, so this area comes under um, the district of what they call Western Sydney, there's about 2,500 children wow. in out-of-home care. And so if we don't foster them, what happens to them? Well, <laughs> some of them literally go into hotels um, and they can spend... Um, <clears throat> oh, you know, weeks sometimes, not ideal, uh, but some of them can be in a hotel with round the clock changing workers, which you can imagine is not a very, no. it's a very, not a very good environment for children yeah. who have been removed um, from their homes. Um, you know, we're not wanting that, it's not the ideal. And otherwise they end up going in placements that are probably not the best placements because we're very short on carers. And then they end up going from place to place because they break down. Mm. Now, I guess there's lots of reasons why we might balk at fostering. And uh, sometimes fostering is for a weekend, for a, a month, you know, uh, or longer. Um, Kayla, what's it like from being a sibling in a family, you know, where, where mum and dad have got this real passion to uh, bless all these kids, but you're on the receiving end. Of that. That's really disruptive, if you like, in your own. How's it been for you growing up and having 16 either adopted or foster children in your life as well? Yeah, so there are a few things that I um, have to answer that question. Uh, the first one is that I sort of grew up the baby, the youngest of the eldest siblings. So when we were going to start fostering, I was sort of like, um, mum and dad made a decision to not foster anybody older than me. Um, so in my head I'm going, oh, yes, I finally have some <laughs> younger siblings that I'm going to get to boss around. <laughs> Um, <laughs> There's an upside to everything, isn't there? Yeah, that's right, Ray. Um, so that was uh, actually quite exciting to me. I was sort of like, oh, you know, I'm going to get some some more brothers and sisters that I can play with and, you know, um, and that's going to be really fun. Um, the second thing was uh, I actually realised how grateful I, I, I am uh, for my family and uh, my parents. Um, so we didn't grow up wealthy or anything, but I had lots of friends that came from money and, as a child, you can often think, oh, you know, if I had money, I could have this or have that or go here or go there or do this or do that. And then when we started fostering children and, you know, I'd hear little bits and pieces about uh, the kids that, you know, came to live with us. I think, yeah, uh, okay, the, the most important thing came that I have a mother and father that love me and take care of me. Uh, and, and that was something that really impacted me growing up. So uh, because of that, I became so much more grateful for my parents and 
food every night and a roof over my head. <laughs> um, and the third thing was that uh, I will probably, you know, if my future family allows it, I would love to foster kids growing up because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because when uh, you when you have relationships with these kids, um, so I did a HSC piece on fostering and my tagline was that they come in strangers and they left my family. And so when you have relationships with these kids, they become more than just, you know, a statistic or a, a video or an ad on TV and, and they become your friends. And when you see the real need for it and you know that in your head and your heart, there's nothing else you can do but want to help them and and it wasn't always easy <laughs> definitely wasn't always easy i'm sure there were many arguments and you know many tiffs but but in the end i can see now as an adult that i am so grateful for it happening yeah thank you so much tracy kayla and to your whole family what a model you've been uh, there's probably nothing more godlike i think than to bring a child into your home and love them and whether it's fostering or adopt them because that's exactly what God has done for every one of us who are in Christ Jesus. Guys, really, really want to say how thankful we are to God for your example. Now, Tracy